this season, I've been testing these excellent lightweight touring skis from Ella and the Ripstick Tour 88, of which you can see my reviews in the playlist linked at the end of this video. And to go over these skis, I've been running them with the Marker Alpinist 12 touring binding, which I'm going to provide a review for now. I chose to pair them with the Marker Alpinist 12 largely for two reasons. Firstly, for the reviews it previously had, which states that it's a very lightweight binding that skis on the downhill like a much heavier and much more fully featured binding. And secondly, for the cost. At around 330 euros for the RRP, it's probably close to 100 euros cheaper than many of its competitors, which is not something to be scoffed at, especially when you're a ski bum like me. The Alpinist range is Marker's fully tech or pin binding touring binding option. Many of you will be familiar with the Kingpin binding, which has a pin or tech toe and a more traditional alpine heel, whereas the Alpinist is a much more lightweight, full-on touring option. It currently comes in three versions, the 8, the 10 and the 12, which I have here, which relates roughly to the DIN setting of the bindings. The Alpinist 8 is the cheapest in the series, with an RRP of around €290. Euros followed by the Alpinist 10, which RRP is at about 310, and as I said previously, the Alpinist 12, which has an RRP of about 330 euros. For this review, I'm going to concentrate specifically on the Alpinist 12, because that's what I have here, but many of the things I say are also applicable to the 8 and the 10 as well. So the Alpinist 12 comes in two colour options, a kind of shiny metallic red, or the kind of gunmetal grey that you can see here, which is what I've got, Ordinarily I would choose the much more brightly coloured red in my gear, but I figured that the red would clash too much with the fluorescent green of these skis already, so I went for the more subtle gunmetal grey. The bindings come in their most simple form as you see them here, with no break with a short travel base. So this short travel base has an adjustability of 7.5mm plus or minus, so that gives you a small amount of adjustability if you're using multiple boots on these skis. Or you can also get the long travel option, which gives you 30 millimeters plus or minus of adjustability, which if you might maybe sharing your skis with other friends or family, that might be the option for you. So in this format, with a short travel base and no break, the binding weighs in at 245 grams per pair. They have an optional break, which is sold separately, or indeed you can buy them as a package, which with the break included, that then increases the weight to about 330 grams per binding. You can get them in three different brake widths, 90mm, 105mm or 115mm, depending on the width of your ski. So, as stated previously, the number, in this case the 12, relates to the DIN or the ISO range. So that's, that's to do with the stiffness of the release of the binding in case of a crash. So the Alpinist 12 has a range of 6 to 12 on the DIN or ISO rating, which is actually the lateral release strain of the binding. So in the case of a crash, the heel piece can twist, giving you a degree of lateral release. Now although it is an international standard rating, hence the ISO range, it's not quite the same as the DIN rating on an alpine ski and binding, although it does roughly correlate. But of course the toe piece has very little, um, well effectively it has no lateral release, so you can't really compare it fully. So it's worth being aware of when you're skiing. So you don't want to be cranking these up quite as hard as you would an alpine binding. So I weigh about 90 kilos and I'm a pretty aggressive skier as I only have this turned up to the lateral release setting of 10 out of 12. And it, indeed in the manual it recommends never turn them up to more than 10, which is slightly strange that they would say that when they sell it as a 12, but I guess that's just to reduce their own liability. Like most pin bindings, these come with the optional attachment of a leash and most manufacturers will have their own specific leash which you can buy with the bindings or indeed they might even come with the bindings that only fits that binding. So I happen to have a pair of G3 leashes kicking around which I thought I might as well try and use them instead of buying new, new leashes. But the kind of the metal wire on these is too stiff to thread through the small hole that you would need to do to attach these leashes specifically to this binding. So I kind of retrofitted them using, in this case, a kind of keyring chain, and on the other side, I've just got a zip tie and attached them in place. Which, of course, neither of those things are likely to hold in the case of a big crash, but that's no bad thing, because the last thing you want in a huge tomahawking fall is your ski 
helicoptering around your, your head, ready to decapitate you. So I fully expect if I were to crash and the skis were to release, that the leashes would fail and I would lose the ski, but at least I wouldn't be injured by the ski. So the leashes are mainly for me in terms of keeping the ski in place if I fall on the uphill and happen to lose a ski, which has happened once, and the, the, the leash just with the zip tie worked. Again, like with leashes, most bindings also have a specific ski crampon that fits their binding. Luckily with these, it's the kind of generic type that you find with a lot of Dynafit and other models. So although you can spend a lot of money on buying mark markers specific ski crampon for these bindings, you can also reuse an old crampon that you might have from a previous binding, which is what I've done here. But they fit on these in exactly the same way, just slots in through the slot, full range of motion. So yeah, save myself a few quid by just being able to reuse an old ski crampon. So to get these bindings from ski mode, which is what they're in now, to walk mode, all we have to do is simply twist the heel piece round. Now, this is much harder to do if you've got the DIN safe setting ramped up than it is if you've got it lower, much lower down because the lateral release function is the same as just twisting it around to get from walk mode to ski mode and vice versa. So. I find it almost impossible to be able to do that on the move. I need to physically take the ski off and twist it round with the full leverage of the ski to get it around. But if you're more flexible than me, and especially if you've got the dins in a lower setting, you might be able to actually just bend down and twist it round behind you. But again, that's just kind of a, that's an aside. It then has three settings when in warp mode. First off, you've got the nought degree setting, so it's effectively no heel ramp, such as that. And then and it has two heel ramp settings, a five degree and a nine degree ramp. So in the vast majority of times, you'll be just switching either between the nought degree and the nine degree, or you'll stick it, stick it in the five degree and leave it like that. Because while it's incredibly simple to switch from nought degrees to nine degrees, all you've got to do is flip the heel piece over like that. It's almost impossible on the move to, to change from five degrees to nine degrees and vice versa. Because to get into the five degree setting, you got to turn the heel piece back round again, and then bring the heel piece the riser over, back over the front so it's sitting on top of the pins so that stops you re-engaging your heel. So yeah, the most vast majority of the time when I'm using this, I forget the five degree ramp, and I just stick it in nine degrees and flip between naught and nine. And that's incredibly easy to do on the move. All you need to do is get the basket of your pole underneath there and flick it over. And indeed, with a bit of practice, you could probably do that mid-stride. So it's probably one of the few criticisms I would have with this binding. The fact that, in reality, you've only really got one heel ramp that you can effectively use, and that's a 9 degree heel ramp. And although that is the highest ramp in this instance, that's often kind of the, the around the degrees of the middle ramp and a lot of other bindings. A lot of bindings might have about an 8 degree middle riser, and they might have a 12 or even a 14 degree high riser. I know a lot of people who will say, that you shouldn't be using the highest ramp anyway, because if you're ramping the heel up that high, that means your skin track is way too steep, and you should just be setting a, a, a less steep angled skin track. I mean, that's all well and good if you're setting the skin track yourself, but if you're following someone else's skin track and they happen to have a, high, a higher heel ramp than you've got, then you're gonna be struggling a lot trying to follow their skin track, but it's still less effort following their skin track than it is making your own. One aspect of the Alpinist range, which is fairly unique to the Alpinists, is their active length compensation in the heel piece. This means that when you're mounting them, you mount it so that the back of the binding, sorry, the back of the boot is flush to the binding piece. Whereas normally in a pin tech binding, you need to leave a space, a slight gap between the back of the heel and the, um, the front of the heel piece of the binding. So when the ski flexes forwards and backwards, there's some room for the for the binding to basically move in and out of the holes in the heel, in the, in the heel piece. Whereas with these, with the Alpen S12, the whole heel piece moves backwards and forwards slightly to, 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 to accommodate that space. So you don't actually need to leave a gap. One aspect of the Alpen range which I really like is the fact that there's effectively a zero degree heel ramp when you're in ski mode. So if you can, I don't know if you can tell or not, but your boot is effectively flat when you're clipped into the binding in ski mode. Whereas in some bindings, the heel piece is raised up. Where so, for example, so for example, these slightly old school Dynafit speed turn bindings, the heel piece is raised up 
much higher off of the base plate compared to these. So you in effect have about half an inch heel riser when you're in ski mode. That makes it feel like you're skiing with high heels on the whole time, which isn't particularly pleasant. So with the Alpinist, you've got a flat foot when you're skiing in downhill mode, which means that they're incredibly well balanced, which makes for really nice smooth turns. The final component to note is the white bits on the binding and both the toe and the heel, which are anti-ice pads, which in theory prevents icing up of both the heel and toe piece and should mean that it's easier to step in and out of the bindings. Now, well, I've not noticed that the bindings ice up at all, so in that regard they have worked. I must say that it doesn't necessarily make it any easier to get in. In fact, one of the major criticisms of this binding that many people have is how difficult they are to step into. And, well, perhaps I'm not just not very good at stepping into them in the first place, but it usually takes me a good two, three, sometimes even five or six attempts to get the toe piece engaged. And, yeah, maybe that's just me, but I know other people who usually step into their binding first time who will take two or three goes to get into these. So even in spite of that anti-ice pads, they're still actually quite difficult to get into. So in terms of performance, which of course is the main, most important factor of any binding, and on the uphill, these are an incredibly lightweight binding, and they're very well balanced as well. The heel and toe piece are almost the same weight, or at least it feels that way. So they give for a very smooth and efficient step and swing when you're, when you're skiing uphill. Transitioning on these is relatively quick and efficient, although you do need to take the ski off to be able to do it, or at least I do. There's no faffing around with all fiddly parts like something you might get on the um, Salomon Shift bindings, for example. It's just a simple twist of the heel and you're done. And in terms of downhill performance, they ski as well as any um, pin binding that I've tried. And indeed, the fact that you've got a very much, you've got a, a flat foot when you're in ski mode means that in my opinion they ski a lot better than some pin bindings. And they feel really stiff and sturdy. You get plenty of power transfer into the snow when you're skiing with these. So you, you can sometimes forget that you're in a pin binding and indeed you can charge as if you're on a, a full alpine binding. So they're a very stiff and reassuring binding. So when you are skiing steep challenging terrain, you don't feel like these are going to release on you. So while out of habit, I do tend to lock the toe piece when I'm on really extreme low fall zone terrain. When I'm just charging down the piece, there's definitely no need to have the toe piece lock, locked at all. So in summary, the Marker Alpinist series of bindings are a very affordable Simple and effective touring binding, which is very lightweight and outperforms many heavier bindings on the descent. While there are a few negatives, such as them being slightly awkward to clip into and the lack of a higher heel, heel riser, on, on the whole, the positives significantly outweigh negatives. So especially if you are slightly strapped for cash and wanting a very lightweight but effective touring binding, then these are a very good option for you.